Right, Paul. So here we are in the middle of the year, June, when there's hardly any dark skies at all. But uh, let's but see still, what we... still plenty to see, though. <laughs> there is still plenty to see. You've just got to pick your targets. OK, well, let's start, as we always do, with the inner solar system. So we'll start with Mercury. Now, it had a disappointing show last month. And to be fair, it's only going to fare marginally better during <laughs> June. It's a morning planet, but being located south of the ecliptic plane fails to gather much in the way of altitude before sunrise. On the plus side, it is brightening, and by mid-month it'll shine at magnitude minus 0 0.6, which isn't bad for Mercury, and it'll rise 50 minutes before the sun. On the 16th of June, there's a 4% lit waning crescent moon, 7.4 degrees to the west and slightly to the north of the planet. And on the 17th, the moon will be quite thin. It'll be 1% lit and lie 5.4 degrees to the northeast of Mercury. As the month progresses, Mercury will appear to brighten, but as it's closing in on the sun's position, it'll be lost in the glare during the last third of June. So it's going to be quite a tough object to uh, observe. However, if we can, can contrast that with the next planet out, Venus is still pretty good. Um, it kind of reaches the turning point in the evening this month, uh, reaching a position known as greatest elongation. So that's its furthest position from the sun on the eastern side of the sun. And that occurs on the 4th of June uh, when the sun and Venus will be separated by about 45.4 degrees. And at this time on the 4th of June, Venus is predicted to be at 50% illumination. Although, as we said in last month's uh, virtual planetarium, 50% illumination will occur before the 4th of June due to the phase anomaly. So start looking. Hopefully you've been looking at Venus towards the end of May and have noticed that. Yeah. Well, the position of Venus in the sky is actually going to deteriorate because um, on the 1st of June, it sets three and a half hours after the sun. But by the end of the month, that figure will have dropped to just two hours after the sun. So don't get complacent with Venus because it will <laughs> disappear very rapidly. In fact, I know that at the end of July, Venus will set more or less with the sun. So um, the best time to observe it is to is during the day when it's well above the horizon. So you need to to um, get your skill at locating Venus during the day sorted out, really, to get a good view of it as it moves into its beautiful crescent phase. Yes, and which will be happening after June. Um, uh, at the moment, as we said, uh, it will be at Dichotomy on the 4th of June, well, before the 4th of June. So you'll notice that the Terminator starts to get a slight dent in it, and then the crescent phase will start after that, which I think is your favourite part of Venus, isn't it? Oh, it's a beautiful thing and quite um, challenging to actually get a good shot of it as it gets thinner and thinner, those really thin... Um, cusps of Venus cause major issues when you're trying to image them because of the seeing. They, they're distorted and uh, adjusted in their appearance quite radically by the slightest bit of wobbliness in the atmosphere. So it's quite a tricky thing to get right, really, to get the uh, that beautiful crescent. But it's well worth persevering because it is stunning. Yeah. OK, and we should note that a 12% lit waxing crescent moon sits near Venus on the evening of the 21st of June. Uh, and on this date, magnitude 1.7 Mars will appear close by too, although it will look quite a lot fainter compared to Venus. <laughs> <laughs> OK, well, sticking with Mars then, uh, still an evening planet, uh, but very faint now, magnitude 1.6. It crosses the Beehive Cluster, M44, over the 1st to the 3rd of June. Uh, but the low altitude and bright twilight means it's going to be very difficult to pick out the stars of the Beehive Cluster. Yes, it will. But it, it's it's worth having a go, I suppose. If you've got a, a bit of magnification, um, you stand a reasonable chance of seeing some of the stars there. The planet actually appears in front of the Beehive on the 2nd of June. Um, and on the 1st and the 3rd, it's either side of the cluster. So gives you three days, really, hopefully, to, to get some clear weather. Do we get wet clear weather within a three-day window in the uk not if there's something on no no if there's an, <laughs> if there's an event that these three days we shall have five days of clouds <laughs> yes that's right just to make sure just to make okay. doubly sure yeah yeah well uh, what about jupiter then jupiter's getting better isn't it 
it's slowly getting better, yes. So best time to see it actually is towards the end of the month. Um, it's a morning object. Uh, it doesn't gain much height uh, in, in before the morning twilight in Golfsib, but it is there and it is a fairly bright object, so worth looking at. Um, a 15% lit waning crescent moon sits 0.6 degrees north of Jupiter at 0500 UT or 0600 BST if you prefer on the 14th of June but uh, slowly improving Jupiter I'm but it's going to be best better this year than it has been for many years well I was going to say it's just uh, I'm really looking forward to it actually because it's sitting in southern Aries and it's going to get to a decent altitude I think uh, as we start to head into um to july it will improve dramatically and then as we go into august and september it'll be reaching an altitude of about 50 degrees up yeah almost overhead in darkness almost oh. overhead Sorry. it's i can't even imagine that height of planet <laughs> no just, never have we seen the like in these ear parts <laughs> oh dear the, the southern hemisphere listeners are going What's all the fuss? Yeah, well, a <laughs> couple of years, they'll be they'll understand what all the fuss will be about. <laughs> all right, moving out, the planet Saturn. So Saturn's situation is slowly improving, um, but it's not ideal. Uh, but it is slowly climbing further north. Saturn takes about 30 years to go around the sun, yeah. so it will spend many years in a constellation. Great when it's Taurus or the northern constellations, but when it's the southern constellations, that means it's gone for quite a long time but it is improving and the planets will have a low altitude uh, with the dawn twilight m making it a bit too bright to observe but things will improve later on in the year a uh, 58 percent lit waning gibbous moon sits four degrees below magnitude 0.7 saturn on the 10th of june so it'll be a nice thing to watch out for yeah and the other two planets, of course, are Uranus and Neptune, and they're not really visible this month, so we'll skip over them. Let's go straight on to the specials then, which are happening in June. And we've, we've only got a few of those actually to look out for, so we'll concentrate more on the, um, the night sky. All month, of course, and into next month, these are the best months for spotting elusive noctilucent cloud displays. So these are things which you've got to look out for. Um, typically... If they're there, a typical display will be low above the northwest horizon, say 90 to 120 minutes after the sun has set, and a similar time low above the northeast horizon um, before sunrise. But they don't always play by the rules. No, there was that one time we had a very good display in Leicester, but it was to the west in the evening. I know. And I, I, know. I texted you and you said, don't talk rubbish, that never happens. <laughs> I kept that text <laughs> so I could show it to you. Uh, and you went out and looked and said, oh, God, yes, there is. It's very impressive. That's the only time I've ever noticed that, though. I don't think normally they're, they're not round that far round to the west, are they? No. Uh, in the evening. It, that was quite unusual. If you get a good display, of course, they um, they appear low above the northwest horizon, and then they appear to eke round to the north, and then end up in the northeast. So it's I think that's something which is quite uh, endearing about them. Actually, you're never quite sure what it is you're going to get with them. So um, yeah, that's it's a good thing to look out for. Okay, well, uh, we've got Venus also being to the north of the beehive cluster on the 13th of june that's going to be even harder than it was for mars <laughs> because the um the, the twilight is going to destroy the beehive basically uh, the other three events which we'll mention very briefly are on the 17th when you've got the earliest sunrise of the year and then on the 21st, we've got the summer solstice, where the sun reaches its most northerly point in the sky against the stars. And then on the 25th, it's the latest sunset for 2023. I bet you're looking forward to those, aren't you? Oh, yes. I can hardly contain myself. Um, I think <laughs> have a party to celebrate them, since you're not going to do any astronomy because it will be too bright. It's, um, and before, we, before we move on, actually, there, it's interesting to note that the sun has been quite active of late and there that's have been true. a number of um, events happening which have resulted in some bright and extensive auroral displays. Now, you might think, yeah, but in June you're not going to get to see anything. But I do remember a few years back, actually from the south coast of England, seeing an auroral display on Midsummer's Day. 
So it is possible, and it is you possible. just never know. Like all things in astronomy, never sure. That's why we go out and make the observations and see. Very well put. OK, well, let's now head out into the night sky. And I suppose the classic bit of uh, navigation at this time of year is follow the arc of the handle of saucepan away from the pan and you come to the brilliant orange star Arcturus, the brightest nighttime star in the northern celestial hemisphere. And it's the main star of the kite-shaped constellation of Boötes the Herdsman. And if you extend that curve round, eventually you'll arrive at Spica or Spica, which is the brightest star in Virgo, which is starting to drift out of the way. But as we head east from Virgo, we start to encounter the stars of summer. First, we have two fairly distinct stars low down, which represent the constellation of Libra, the scales or balance. Uh, next to this, we find the altitude challenged constellation of Scorpius, and this is marked by the distinctive orange star Antares. Said to be the rival of Mars, but I think it always looks much redder than Mars to me. Um, but it's quite a quite an impressive star. It's quite an impressive constellation, Scorpius. Unfortunately, from the UK. The lower half of the constellation is cut off, and yep. if you go further south, you can see it. You only have to go really south of France, and I've seen uh, Scorpius a lot higher, and you can see the whole constellation. And it does look like a crawling insect of a, uh, a scorpion. Yes, it does. Very uh, much it's so. quite, it's quite distinctive, uh, really. And it's a shame that the full constellation never really rises from the UK. But no, it disappears actually quite rapidly because you've got Antares there, which is a it's a striking star of the June sky. But it sort of because it's so low down, it moves out of the way quite fast. So you don't get a very good view of it no. as you head into the later or, or well into the summer. I think part of the problem is, is because of its low altitude, it peaks at a very low altitude. And so it's obscured by houses and trees for a lot of yeah. the time. So there's actually only a short window to see it. Uh, we should mention, of course, nearby to Arcturus is the beautiful globular cluster Messier 4. Um, this is a charming little globular. I think it's often overlooked and it is quite an impressive one. It's magnitude 7.5, so very easy. In fact, you should be able to see that in binoculars. And over 7,000 light years away, so this is quite a good distance from us yeah well above scorpius is a large region of sky that is well it's devoid of anything bright really isn't it <laughs> and that's the constellation of a the serpent bearer um, it's a group of stars that it's been described in a number of different ways um, an upturned flower pot um, and i think some uh, cultures describe it as looking a bit like a coffin there's a sort of asterism there which is coffin shaped um, which actually does stand out quite well to be honest um, but he's the serpent bearer of course and he wouldn't be complete without his serpent and <laughs> it's the only bifurcated constellation in the entire night sky serpents the serpent uh, to the east of Aphucus, we've got serpents cauda which is the serpent's tail and to the west serpents caput the serpent's head and it's probably fair to say this is it's quite a confusing area of sky isn't it there's not an awful lot of signposts there to go by no unfortunately the the stars themselves aren't overly bright aren't particularly bright and no. they're actually spread out over quite a wide area yeah they are so it, it's not really easy to pick everything out um i think though like a lot of things in astronomy, once you found them, you do tend to remember where they are, but finding them to begin with can be a bit difficult. The head of a, a Fucus is marked by the orange supergiant Russell Haig. It's magnitude 2 and sits exactly where you would expect it to be uh, at the top of the constellation. Uh, close by, we have the constellation of Hercules, and uh, the head of Hercules is the star Rassel Getty, although this actually sits at the bottom it of does. the constellation. It's actually, I didn't realise for quite some time that what we think of Hercules is actually upside down in the night sky. It's interesting, because <laughs> if you look at the stick figure, he looks like he's the right way up. It does carrying it's, a club and marching across the sky. It does that. Particularly, what does it for me is the keystone asterism of Hercules. Yeah. That kind of looks like the torso, as you would imagine. It does, yes. So uh, yeah, but uh, I think we should we should invert Hercules. We should we should 
have a campaign to turn him upside down. We should. We should redraw it so uh, <laughs> everyone could say. Uh, of course, the Keystone asterism that we mentioned is where you'll find the M13 Great Globular Cluster. Um, it's about two-thirds of the way up between the two westernmost, so the stars on the right-hand side of that Keystone asterism. Yeah. Again, another very distinctive globula. Okay. Well, to the east of Hercules and Ephucus, we see the most distinctive asterism in the entire sky. Well, that's probably pushing it a bit, actually, because I think <laughs> the plough is probably um, a little bit more distinctive. But it's the giant summer triangle, which is now moving into view, and it's formed by three principal stars of the constellations of Lyra the Lyre, which is Vega, of course, Cygnus the Swan, which is Deneb, and Aquila the Eagle, which is Altair. Well, one of the great things about this time of year is how well-placed the Milky Way is yeah. uh, for observation. This is the one of the spiral arms of our galaxy. And the great thing about the Milky Way at this time of year is it's easy to find because it runs down through the centre of the cross of the constellation Cygnus. And it becomes denser and brighter as it gets closer to the southern horizon. And that's because near Sagittarius or in Sagittarius is the centre of the galaxy and yeah. we're getting a lot of the star clouds of Sagittarius and it really is a stunning sight um, from the city and towns it can be a struggle to pick up but you don't have to go to a very dark sky to see it uh, but if you can see it in a dark sky it really is what astounds me is the amount of structure that's in it yes. just you know an aided eye uh, in a dark sky the amount of structure you can see in it it's actually it's worth noting that if you if you're in a city or a town then obviously it, it doesn't really stand out at all if you're in a, a reasonable dark area you can normally start to get a hint of it running there but if you can locate somewhere which is even just a little bit darker it can make a huge difference in the view and you can really, as you say, start to bring out the mistiness. I, I suppose we ought to explain why it looks the way it does. And the way to do that is to um, realise that the Milky Way represents the light from hundreds of billions of stars, which are too far away to be seen individually to the naked eye. The way to think of the structure of the Milky Way is to imagine two fried eggs slapped back to back. That's the sort of basic <laughs> shape of it. A bit messy, I think. Um, but if you've got that, the sun sits about two thirds of the way out from the centre towards the edge. And all the stars you can see individually in the night sky sit in a bubble around the sun, which is about 10,000 light years across. So those are the ones which you can see easily individually with the naked eye. But the Milky Way is much bigger than that. It's about 100,000 light years from one side to the other. And the other hundreds of billions of stars, which you can't see individually, are so far away that their light just merges together to form this mistiness. And that's what we call the Milky Way. And it looks like a path because of the flat nature of the, the two fried egg slap back to back nature of the Milky Way. It's like a plane of stars. It is, and it's quite impressive, uh, really. Uh, the other thing that, that brings out the structure is the fact that it's not just stars there. There's clouds of gas and dust. Yes. And this dust blocks the starlight, so you get regions which look like they've been reduced in starlight or you can't see and other regions where there is no dust and you can see all the starlight is really quite a, uh, a a remarkable sight so yes absolutely and it, of course it's worth bearing in mind that the brightest part of it should be the core but because that's so low for us in the uk it isn't really the brightest part the brightest part we see is the bit which passes through cygnus which gets really high up for us um, probably June isn't the best time to look for it, actually, because we're getting towards the, the solstice. So the sun is going to cause you're not going to have any darkness at night. It's just going to be really deep twilight, basically, um, unless you live really far north in the UK, in which case it's it's quite noticeable twilight. Um, but as you go into July and August and through into September, that's the time when the Milky Way really stands out. It could be really quite dramatic. And it's that region passing down the asterism which is known as the northern cross which is the core of cygnus the swan which is the really standout feature and if you can see the mistiness of the milky way there it splits in two because of a dark dust lane which is known as the cygnus rift 
Yeah, that's quite striking. Um, it also comes out quite well in binoculars. Um, yes. One of the things I've always liked to do in the summer is take a pair of binoculars and scan down all the way from Cygnus through Scutum down to Sagittarius. There's yeah. lots of rich star fields and clusters, and it really is quite a splendid sight in binoculars. Yes, it is indeed. Well, before we finish this month, let's take a look to the north and see if you can pick out the distinctive constellation of Cassiopeia, the Seated Queen. It's very easy to see Cassiopeia, actually, because the whole constellation is one giant asterism, basically. It looks like the letter W. And at this time of year, it lives up to its name. Yes. Because the W <laughs> will be in the right position to look like a W. So the, the asterism finally does look like it, what it's supposed to. Yeah. Well, although uh, we only have a few hours of darkness, there's still plenty to see. So wish everybody clear skies. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Paul. Thanks, Pete.